So as I was saying, it's a very timely discussion, and we're absolutely thrilled to have these six wonderful women with us today. We do see nightly on our news footage of, uh, from Syria. We see the devastation and we see the untold suffering. But what is harder for the cameras to capture often are the efforts of people working for peace. And so I think we're particularly blessed today to have with us these six women who are working on the ground and in diplomatic circles to try to find a diplomatic solution to the Syrian conflict. We know that research tells us that peace processes are more successful and more durable when women, backed by movements and having a meaningful influence, are involved. So we're really fortunate today to have with us distinguished leaders from the legal sector, uh, researchers, politicians, journalists, business leaders, and they're all activists in their own right. Many are members and founders of the Syrian women's political movement, and they come from different parts of Iraq, and they all bring different perspectives to the discussion. So I'd like to just really briefly introduce you to them. I think you have the biographies, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Um, first, right beside me, we have Ruba Habush, who's a member of the, the they're all members of the Syrian Nation Commission. Um, uh, Ruba comes from a journalist background. Um, so this is a very important area. She's currently a news anchor on Iraqi Fallujah TV channel. And she has also had a, a background in, in participating in peaceful anti-regime demonstration in Idlib. And we were, um, hopefully we'll get a chance for her to talk about some of the experiences from that part of Iraq. Next to Ruba, Syria, we, Syria. Oh, sorry, I'm Syria. sorry, Syria, my, my brain is, is maybe not enough coffee this morning. Um, <laughs> next to, um, to Ruba, we have Hint Kabawat, who is currently the deputy head of the SNC office in Geneva and director of interfaith peace building at the Center for World Religions. Um, Hint has a background in, in the women's movement and, and working to, uh, to solidify women's participation in the Syrian opposition. Next down the, down the line, we have um, Hanadi Abu Arab, who is currently the deputy chairperson and vice president of the SNC. And she has a, a legal background. She has served as a judge in Syria and has also been the, was the only woman to participate in ceasefire uh, talks in Kazakhstan, um, where she was the legal advisor to the armed opposition. Next, we're fortunate to have with us Basma Kodmani, who's a researcher and a scholar with a distinguished uh, uh, experience and record in this, in this area. She's a co-founder and executive director of the Arab Reform Initiative, which a long-standing IDRC partner. Next, we have Fadwa Ojili, who, is, who has been working on the Syrian conflict since 2012. She brings a business background to, to, this, uh, to this discussion and has been a negotiator in various processes. Last but not least, we have Alice Mofrej, who um, has a, a political background. Um, and she's, she founded the Syrian Women for a State of Citizenship, an organization that works to promote peace and create economic economic opportunities for women. So please, join me in welcoming our panelists. So how this is going to work this morning is that we have a, a number of questions and we hope to have a little bit of an informal discussion with different panelists feeding into to different questions. And then hopefully we'll have some time to open it up to the audience for, for some, uh, from some questions from, from you. Um, I'd like to start this morning with a question on the negotiation process. Um, Basma, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about where the negotiations stand right now and what are your priorities as a negotiation team? Thank you. I first want to start by saying uh, how grateful we are to have give, been given this opportunity to visit Canada 
uh, and to be hosted by IDRC and the Global Center for Pluralism here in Ottawa this morning. So th a big thank you for this opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, I would like to say that when we start our meetings, formal meetings of Syrians, in many cases, we take a minute of silence. I will not ask you for that minute of silence, but what I will do is tell you that that silence is in the heart of each of us here because as negotiators, we have to silence the suffering and the violence that has happened to our people. And our role will be to ask the women and the Syrians on the ground that that silence they need to keep in order for us to reach a possible solution. We talk about a just solution. We want it to be as just as possible. But when we say as just as possible is we do want to reach a peaceful solution for Syria. I will say in a few words uh, where we are today in this process. Over the last uh, two years, in this format and in an ex a now expanded format, we have served as the opposition representatives of the opposi Syrian opposition. But when we say Syrian opposition, it's a very diverse group of people from different communities, different regions, different professions, different political backgrounds. Uh, but we are all committed to a democratic uh, Syria, a future democratic Syria. Over the last two years, we have not been able to have any negotiations per se. And you are, I think, all informed uh, that uh, these talks that happen in Geneva under the UN auspices have never so far <coughs> led to a serious bilateral session where we sit across the uh, representatives from the Assad regime. That tells you that the intention to negotiate a settlement, a political settlement, has really not been there. We have lacked a partner for two years now, and we long for this partner. We feel our partner is never going to be a regime that doesn't want to listen, uh, but maybe the international community, maybe those who are supporting this regime maybe they will understand that time has come for a cessation of the violence. I think we are at the moment, and this is too early to say maybe, at a turning point. And that is that uh, Russia has supported the regime in pushing the violence to the extreme, to going till the end in uh, using violence to uh, change the situation on the ground. But I think Russia has just realized that this military victory has also brought with it a very dangerous situation on the ground. The Assad regime is very weak. It is uh, entirely supported by militias organized by Iran on Syrian territory. So Iranian presence is very heavy, very present and very visible. And that our neighbor to the south does not like that. And that if countries are willing to live with Iran, Israel is not uh, going to accept a presence of Iran on Syrian soil. That draws a scenario of a major confrontation that may not be limited to only Syria. That will that could be could could turn into a regional confrontation. And with the presence of all these international powers on the ground it could go f further. So I would say maybe at this particular point uh, we could see some Russian interest in a political process and from there possibly to force the regime into a uh, entering into negotiations. To talk about a constitution for Syria, to talk about elections, and we may come back later to this because it's an important uh, issue, to talk about how we create a safe and neutral environment in Syria in order to hold elections, to implement a constitutional framework, and to implement political transition. 
Can I just say in one uh, sentence, the biggest challenge for us today is that the peace process remains under UN auspices and under the terms of reference of the United Nations resolutions, that these don't become just a piece of paper. As we know for Palestine, the resolutions have never been implemented. For Syria, it is I'm not going to say more serious. Palestine is uh, hugely serious for the international community. But Syria is serious enough as a security issue, a political issue, a moral issue before anything else to uh, keep it in a, a framework of a legitimate solution under what the UN has defined as legitimate. Thank you, Basma. You've raised a number of, of um, very important points going forward in terms of the of the regional situation and, and the, the potential explosive nature now of, of actually an, an acceleration of the of the conflict. Um, and then highlighted some of the priorities going forward in terms of elections, constitutions, and and a safe and neutral environment uh, in in Syria. I'm wondering if anyone would like to comment on that. Hanadi, did you have anything to add to, to Basma's comments? In fact, my colleague Basma, my colleague Basma have already, has already covered all the aspects of the, in her answer. However, I need to add one more thing regarding Syria. Always we have something new. There are changes, political changes, uh, there are changes on the ground, and we have to deal with a lot of issues at the same time. Yesterday there was a meeting between Russia and the, Russia and the Syrian regime in Sochi and there was uh, negotiations and agreements on uh, different issues. Uh, one of them is the political settlement. The important thing about this meeting and we need to focus on here is that the political process has to be under the auspices of the United Nations because there will be no uh, resolution that could be reached unilaterally. It has to be universal. It has to be under the UN supervision. This solution to the pro to the problems has to be given uh, under the umbrella of the United Nations. The political solution has to be uh, multilateral. Has to be transparent. It has to include opposition in all its parts. Thank you very much. And one of the elements in terms of, of UN negotiations is that there's been growing support for women's participation and the role of the UN in increasing um, the number of, of women as negotiators, as mediators. Um, um, so I'm wondering, Fadwa, if you could tell us a little bit about why, from your perspective, it is important to have women negotiators. Are there specific issues that you've brought to the negotiations agenda that otherwise might not have been addressed? Okay. Before everything, I would like to uh, say a big salute to the women around the world who have proven themselves in all walks of life, politics and civil. I salute the Syrian women because they are during the last seven years they have proved that they are capable of becoming negotiators activists not only mothers and husbands or wives of martyrs they have participated actually in negotiations women's participation and women's role has proved through the international reports that they can sustain peace in more than 27 percent and resolution number 1325 has stressed the fact that there is a huge role for Syrian women in negotiation the women right now are between two parts in negotiation. First, the change, uh, like changing the uh, f uh, forces in Syria, uh, 
because they need to establish the state of citizenship and freedoms under uh, multilateral democratic systems and includes women's rights in general. The women's participation is important because it stresses the fact that they have a strong role in the community and also uh, they have a massive network of rights that are available for them and uh, the democratic countries uh, need to work hand in hand uh, with these uh, women in order to provide uh, all the necessary uh, necessary aspects of, of life and be part of the government's institutions, such as uh, be part in elections and uh, nomination for elections. The absence of women uh, in negotiation is, is not a good thing, but now when the women participating in negotiations would, ha would increase their role in the future. And this will have uh, change, uh, the, uh, will have uh, achieve transition in the situation. And this uh, presence of women proves that the opposition is really keen to change and make this change and create the state of citizenship and equality. that you think are now on the agenda that um, that that women have brought that you've brought to these discussions that that might not have been raised if there had only been men around the table if if Senator Jaffer is here she often tells the story of of, of women having better knowledge on the ground um, because of their contacts mm -hmm. um, in, in, in another negotiation. Are there, are there examples of issues that have come up because of your presence there that wouldn't have been before? I don't know if, if Fadwa or Elise, we'd like to answer that. At the beginning, thank you so much for having us here. I thank Canada sincerely for having us. Uh, gender policy is not uh, adopted by so many countries, and uh, Ms. Ruba here with us is a real ambassador for this. The gender equality is a problem not only in Syria and so many other countries. The voice of Arab women in the negotiation tables is, does not only concern their presence on the floor, but also they have to be there in their resolution making and decision making. They have to extend and reach out to the community and make their voices be heard. They have to connect the situation on the floor and also uh, to the uh, process of negotiation. We need to work on uh, big networks and throughout big networks of women that support women's rights. These are examples. We have already participated uh, as women. When we sat at the negotiation table, we tried to work on, the, on two fronts. The civil society that supports women on one hand, and there was a pressure, uh, they formed a pressure force to make the resolution at the table. And we had also to take into consideration that these negotiations were not enough to be uh, active in the process. But we had to establish something called the women political movement in order to become a participant and a partner in the process to join the two aspects. I have to answer the third question as well. What successes and challenges have you had 
um, or that you faced um, oh. as women negotiators. I imagine that some of the systems that are in place, um, you're a minority and you face opposition to even being there. So if you could tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a woman around these tables mm. and, and successes that you've had and lessons you've learned and, and, challenge, and um, challenges going forward. Honestly, it's a huge achievement because according to the man's uh, way of thinking, the woman's presence uh, has a lot of challenges. So one of the challenges is uh, by language. By language, a woman means a mother, a wife, and someone that is uh, dependent on someone else. And also uh, the idea of seeing a woman working uh, on aspects uh, like political is not uh, something agreeable. But now, as women make 50% of the community, uh, having them working in this aspect is really a big achievement. Secondly, the political demands always contradict with rights, especially the rights of women. And when those rights got eliminated, there will be not enough uh, political settlement. We have to deal uh, with including gender issues in the political process as inseparable component of the uh, democratic reform. So if we want to reach the state of law, uh, irrespective to religion, gender, and other social aspects. For example, when I speak about the state of law, this is inseparable from the um, political process, including women's rights, and the state of law is the uh, preoccupation of the international community. And we have to separate between the uh, lo uh, legislative uh, authority and other types of authorities. This has to be uh, uh, re including all Syrians. As women on the negotiation table, uh, we have been uh, facing a lot of difficulties because of quotas with men. And these quotas do not allow enough number of women to reach out to the political process. In 2013, United Nations resolution stipulates that women's participation in the political process is an essential component of building security and peace. Therefore, I think uh, including women in this process is essential and key in here. As I said earlier in my comments, that we as women, we have been there on the ground as a personal experience. I have made uh, many uh, organizations and groups that supports women's presence in order to uh, uh, extend their voice and, and ideas to the other parties. So there was a, a, a merge between uh, the political process and the, and the negotiation process. This was a necessity for us in order to be there at the table. And we had to adopt a mechanism in order to include women uh, with a percentage of no less than 30%. So uh, we are still not very satisfied with this achievement. However, we are getting there. And we need to work hard on uh, having this uh, feminine agenda in the process. We want to include women's rights in all aspects, all components of negotiations. Even in the security and terrorism files, women's rights, they have to be there. Ultimately, uh, hopefully, we reach a, a resolution that ends everything. I want to add here that the major achievement in this aspect is that we have uh, reached uh, to the establishment of a, a group that is called Equal Citizenship. 
And this has uh, reached out to the international community. The world knows about it. And we have done a great deal uh, so far. I would. Oh, no, I so, Rupa, would you like to yes. add to add to that on yes. on the successes and challenges of women negotiators? I will add one more thing to the challenges. The problem is that men look at our figures; they don't look at our minds. As an anchor and a program presenter on TV for the past 15 years. My first problem, men look at my figure. They look at my body and face. They don't look at what I do. So therefore, I have to work double effort than men in order to prove who I am. Men get paid more than women without looking at their uh, abilities and potential. So. The same problem I have faced in my negotiation work. The men look at the way I walk and the way I dress. They look at my figure. They don't look at my potential. This is a big issue, and we need to focus on it in our uh, negotiations and in our dialogue here. Uh, I agree that all my colleagues have faced the same problem, and I think this is a major, major issue. I need to add one more thing here, please. I just want to add one more thing. We always hold the international community responsible uh, for the issue of uh, working on women's rights, and they do not put men in order to prove their rights. It's, it doesn't mean women only. This rights issue doesn't mean women only. It means men as well. It's not only women's concern, it's also men's concern. So men and women have to work together in order to solve this issue. Raising Ruba, we're facing here in Canada too. I know that the pay gap and uh, <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not just it's not just an issue uh, 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 elsewhere. Um, and and certainly the issue of working with men is something that's been on the agenda as, as well. And and we've we've talked about it that often the the legitimacy of who do you represent is a question that's asked to women, but not also to to men on the. Um, uh, on the negotiations, which if we can shift gears a little bit, one of the, the areas that can help us document this, make the case for change, is research. Um, this event is co-sponsored by, by RD, IDRC. Um, and so we thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the role that research can play in supporting you as negotiators. Here in Canada, we've often cited the figures in the research that says if women are involved, a peace process will be more likely to be reached and be more durable if women and representatives of women's organizations are, are involved. But are there gaps in knowledge that you can identify that could help prepare negotiations, improve the future rounds of negotiations, um, and help give us more, more tools to work with? Ruba, I think this is over to you. Of course, uh, studies and research uh, are what we need the most. We do not have a big experience in Syria when it comes to the uh, participation of women, especially in the political process. I believe we are ambitious. Uh, we look forward uh, to have uh, uh, women's rights just like Canada, although we are way too far from that. But we want to look at experiences that are similar to the Syrian experience and how we can benefit from such experiences and how in such countries women have uh, managed to get into the political process and have become important players. Uh, there are so many countries that have been through crises and experiences similar to Syria. Perhaps uh, it is more fitting to start with such countries and to introduce such experiences into the Syrian realm. I think that studies and research uh, 
when it comes to the social norms and customs in Syria are important because we're different from the Western countries. We have certain culture and certain concepts, whether they're good or bad, uh, whether we accept them or not. But we have to work on changing them by studying their uh, social dimensions uh, when it comes to the customs and traditions, especially because there are women that are against women's rights, not just in Syria, but in so many countries that have uh, similarities to our societies. So when we're looking at the background of such customs and traditions and why women would believe in them, is this way we can change such mentality and present the solutions. There are also studies and research that have to do with the quota and their importance so that women would get into the political process uh, and perhaps uh, through the quota, which is a prescribed percentage uh, once we get into it. My preference is not just to be there because of certain quota, but because based on my efficiency, just like any man without any uh, favoring or discrimination. But perhaps we need to start with the research about the importance of quota. Uh, also among the important researches that we need to do uh, is what Syrian women have been subjected to in the last seven years, whether we're talking about rape or arrest or persecution or marginalization or uh, asking women to play a role that uh, has not done. We have 54% of the population being women. So women are in charge of raising families. Uh, Syrian women used to work outside the house and study, but now the situation is more difficult now. Syrian women have more challenges. For example, I come from Idlib. I have aunts and uncles and cousins uh, uh, of both genders that are still in Idlib. Idlib is now under the control of an extremist organization and my relatives face such difficulties before that we faced the regime and the actions of the regime that uh, are not different if not worse than those of the extremists so we need to research what such women have been through uh, especially in cities like Idlib I speak with passion because I come from Idlib about people there that have nothing to do with extremism and how they can get rid of of these painful experiences and the psychological trauma and social pressures uh, on account of that. We also have to make studies about the laws and how to modernize laws so that women would have a real presence in the political life and in leadership role when we talk about laws. Uh, then men cannot play with the laws because laws are laws. They have to be respected. Uh, I think these are the most important studies and research that we need. There are so many um, uh, perhaps uh, thoughts in that area, but uh, perhaps this is a summary of my point of view as to what is needed the most. Next, uh, <laughs> the next few years, a uh, decade or more, right. Um, Basma, you're, you're a distinguished a researcher in this area. Do you have anything to add in terms of the role research plays in negotiations? I, I want to second uh, what uh, uh, Ruba has just said. I think she raised most of the issues that are critical for the women to assert their role in the, in the political process, definitely. I would add support in uh, um, how constitutional processes take place and how women participate uh, in different contexts, how women uh, are uh, supported uh, in order to uh, participate in elections. I think this is going to be critical for Syria. In terms of, of research, there is a, a, an area which Ruba pointed to, which is also a, a subtle but critical one, and that is the role of women in their own uh, communities in fighting, uh, in uh, deterring, and in expelling radical elements from the social fabric in which they are. And I think this deserves in-depth research. Syria, and particularly Northwest Syria, is a fantastic laboratory for this kind of research. It, will be it would be critical, and this is not about women's role only. 
it is about fighting radicalism and de-radicalization as it is called and fighting terrorism because the eradication of these movements will only come from society we now see that peacefully populations in those areas come out in the streets and say get out of our areas they are expelling those radicals and the women play a critical role in that respect so I think uh, we are looking at a pattern of how you eradicate terrorism it's not by bombing for decades as happened in Afghanistan and as could happen in Syria also with the, the damage that we know in terms of civilians so I think these are areas uh, where it is critical to look at how uh, this happens and also how uh, we can inform the international community all the players regional and international who are uh, involved in bringing back security and stability to our areas there's a missing link usually because the international community even if it has the best intentions doesn't know exactly not just what is happening every day but what the solutions are our experience we know our country but our experience is that the solutions are proposed by people on the ground and those links between the local and the international I think needs to be built as uh, groups uh, who can advise who can uh, uh, convey who can coordinate uh, and I think international uh, organizations and players are not attentive enough to these structures that can mediate this relationship. And here the women, I think, uh, in many contexts, can, can play a very useful role. Thank you. I think, I think that's a, a really important and interesting point. And some of the work globally being done on countering or preventing violent extremism is just starting to take up up, up women's roles um, in, in, in looking at what that means in terms of, of specific uh, community level activities, family level activities, but the importance that it, it be rooted in that local context is something that I keep hearing from, from women's organizations around the, around the world. Um, and, and then linked to that is the question of of, of women's rights, women's legal, social, political, economic, and cultural rights. Um, Hanadi, given your legal background, can you make that link or talk to us a little bit about how negotiations can promote women's rights or how the international community linked to what Basma was saying, how does, how does this fit together? Because if women's rights aren't respected, they can't speak out, they can't play that role. So maybe if you could talk to us a little bit about that, please. Uh, always, and especially in the situation that we live in, the negotiations have to take into account uh, an, uh, the involvement of the voices of women in every step that we take. Uh, uh, myself and my colleagues being uh, political negotiators uh, in the SNC, we always thrive to uh, make the future Syria a place where there is equality, true equality between genders. I want to thank Canada for its leadership role in the gender area. Canada has always been keen on the true uh, equality among genders uh, and uh, when it comes to Syria as well. Also, it's important to enable women so that they would be effective players in their societies, especially in political, social, economical, legal, and even security fields. Uh, obviously, as women in SNC, we are always keen on building strong and healthy relationships with women's group on the ground in Syria and uh, to have uh, ongoing support of women, Syrian women, wherever they are, but all the more on the ground inside Syria in areas that, uh, ha that are difficult to survive in, that are besieged, uh, or the liberated areas that have very limited resources. 
we are keen through our communication with such women is to have uh, training projects, uh, skill development projects, in order to have uh, the preparedness to take true steps in the future, like uh, election, basic education, uh, uh, cultural spaces. Uh, we are very keen on these areas. Uh, uh, also, uh, we uh, seek uh, through our efforts uh, in communicating with those inside and outside of Syria uh, to have uh, uh, true guarantees for women's rights. Uh, and such guarantees would have to be enshrined in the constitution, uh, the future constitution of Syria that would guarantee uh, for real the rights of women and uh, all the demands of women uh, as far as the state, the future state is concerned. Uh, it is also imperative to have a vision to include the Syrian women in the future government at all levels. So it would not just have some nominal uh, positions in nominal ministries or to be just a provisional member in the parliament, uh, but to have roles that are uh, uh, powerful and influential uh, in leadership roles, in true roles, in true ministries, uh, and leadership ministries like defense, uh, foreign affairs. We also have ambition uh, to see women getting elected to the highest offices. Uh, we would like to see change in the current legislation. Uh, Syrian laws currently are unfortunately weak uh, and violate the rights of women. I was a judge in Damascus and I used to see tens of uh, examples of women victims on a daily basis that have been deprived of their rights because of uh, obsolete uh, Syrian laws like personal um, uh, rights, like uh, inheritance, like uh, um, crimes of honor. So there are lots of violations uh, to women's rights. And we are hoping that all of this would be overcome in the future Syria. Thank you. A very um, worthwhile but ambitious agenda to try to uh, take forward in the next while and points to the importance of having women around the table when things like the Constitution are, uh, or the drafting process is, is, is being discussed. Yeah. Did anyone else want to, to add comment. to that? Um, Fadwa, I know you have experience linking to women's groups on the ground or, or civil society on the ground. Is there anything that you would like to add? Um, to Hanadi's comments. Yes, actually, uh, originally I'm from Raqqa, which as everybody knows, uh, they went through the ISIS and they witnessed women and children witness so much of killing and slaughtering. They did so much of that and um, these women need a lot of help. Now we don't have ISIS in Raqqa. ISIS is gone, but we still have those women there, needs a lot of help, needs a lot of mental help. They lost the husband, they lost the father, they lost the brother. Uh, Raqqa full of, um, I would say probably 60% now is women and children. Those the children did not go to school for three years during ISIS uh, there. And uh, they do see the help. There are so many stories I could say and I could tell you what happened and what those women witnessed. But probably if I have a chance I could say one. Uh, one a lady who I knew before and she was a teacher. She took care of her child with uh, no father and for him to be a growing up man, uh, he was in um, high school. When ISIS did somehow 
got him involved on the, with them. So one day the woman told the son, please, she was begging him, let me take you, let's run away from here. The kid, what, what he ended up doing, he went and he told uh, about uh, his mom, what mom says. So what uh, the result was, uh, with that woman in the middle of the street in Raqqa, in like downtown, and they made the sun shoot her. Yeah, in front, and they don't do that just like this. They do it in front of everyone, like they will bring people out. And if somebody doesn't come out, they will say, you gotta come out, you have to see uh, what's gonna happen now. So imagine a lot of women seeing that, a lot of children seeing a mother being killed from, from her own son. So this woman needs a lot of help. And these children need school. And I would like, and I'm here seeking from the Canada's government and from all of you to do something for these women and children. Thank you. Thank you, Fadwa. I think it's, <coughs> it's very hard to know what to say next when you hear yes. a story like that. Um, and, and we know that that's not the, like you say, that's not the only story you can, you can share with us. Which leads us to the last question before we open it up to the audience. Um, and that's, how can countries like Canada support the negotiation team? Uh, negotiation team, your role as women specifically, the search for a, a diplomatic, a political solution in Syria. Um, so we haven't heard from Hint, so I'd like to turn it over to you to, to perhaps lead off on, on your suggestions for, um, like I said, for the Canadian government, but also for the Canadian people. Uh, first, I just want to show my appreciation and happiness to speak in Canada since I'm Canadian. It feel like home, so thank you. Welcome. Yeah, yes. and um, so I can um, I just uh, can capture some few uh, things we can ask. For sure, Canada can work with their partners to create a, a strategy to go back to the negotiation table. We need to go back to Geneva. We know that it's been uh, long now, but we know that without political solution, we cannot have. So number one, we need Canada to push in this direction. Number two, we know that there is a now gap, and there is lots of talk about Idlib, and there is many of the Western country, they don't want to support anymore those uh, provinces, like Raqqa or Idlib. Just want to tell you that it's so important that Canada can lead by example. And you've been always supporting the civil society and women. And because of you, we're here today. And we can be the voice of the voiceless, and we can talk. And thanks for your help and support. But what we need, we need also to support all the women organization, civil society, school, health. And this is so important, because this is the only way I can see the future of Syria, if we can have civil society and women organization being empowered and strong enough to take care of the future. Number three, I, I do believe that we're all here. It's not, we, we're not only, it's not, we're not leaders, we're servants. And we're here to, to tell you how we are so frustrated when we're sitting here and there and somebody is dying in Syria. And when Dr. Kudmani talked about the silence, because every morning we woke up and we know that it's so hard for us. So what we need from Canada to keep sending the messages, protection of the civilians. This is a moral and ethnic, ethnic things. We need to protect those civilians. It is the end of the day, the priority one for our group. Number four, I do believe in there will be no peace without justice. And accountability is everything. 
And I've been going around, many people, they're always concerned about the minority's future, what will happen in Syria to those minority community. And I'm part of one of the, those Christian communities. But I need to tell you, it's so important to talk about a good mechanism for justice, because the only way we can secure a future without violence is, and we, we did see this in the history, when there is no mechanism for justice, the cycle of violence will continue. And we, could, we can't afford it in Syria. We want to keep our multi cultures, I take this from the Canadian uh, uh, things, multi faith, multi ethnic. We need to continue. If we don't have it, we cannot. And uh, I know that Canada will, is very supportive of the triple IM and the accountability and the uh, international tribunals. And I think I'm going to leave this to my colleague, Elise. She's the head of the detainees' uh, files. And I think she will be more, she can talk more details about the triple IM. So before I give you this, you want this. to just spell that out? Trip. What do you mean? What do you? Uh, it is the international uh, independent, uh, international impartial. independent, impartial, and uh, mechanism. mechanism. Yeah. So uh, these four things. It's important for Canada to keep doing the support. And uh, Elise, please. Elise, thank over you. Over to you, and then we'll open it up for some questions from yeah. the audience. And, and then uh, maybe uh, Hanadi will oh, talk a little bit about it. Okay. Uh, it's very important to talk about because of what's happening in Asitana and Suchi and uh, the talks over there, uh, the this is a very important issue uh, for the sustainability of peace in Syria. But what is the political settlement is like? This is important. Before we start to uh, ask and question and hold people accountable for their mistakes and atrocities and, and the like, we need to uh, establish uh, the right was and justice system. Canada is one of 100 countries that supported the uh, independent mechanism that collects evidence of war crimes in Syria. The Syrian regime is totally responsible, not only the only responsible one, but also there are other uh, uh, culprits in that. However, when there is a political will, the international community can achieve something. It can thrive. It can achieve something in Syria. This mechanism is not complete and will not be complete unless there is a serious and earnest effort in order to establish a court in Syria, war crimes court in Syria. The Security Council uh, cannot operate because of the uh, veto, the Russian veto. There should be a meeting of the General Assembly, and especially the fact that Canada is going to preside the Group of Seven, and this is very uh, essential. In Brussels, for example, the European uh, Commission, uh, for example, in Britain, Germany, Sweden, they have met and pushed forward for the uh, accountability of the Syrian regime. A lot of countries are supporting this and also to establish a war crimes court in Syria and to transfer that files to the international uh, criminal uh, court. As women negotiator, in cooperation with the international community, we have to uh, work uh, for the transition of peace and justice in Syria. I'll give you a live example. 
We had a child detainee. She was only 16 years old. She was taken as a captive just because her brother held arms in the uh, free army. And women, uh, this is a, a fact, it's a, it's a common thing. Women are getting arrested just because someone in their family fights. They don't belong to the, to the opposition, the armed opposition. This child was tortured and was uh, uh, sexually assaulted and raped. She cried. I hold her tight because I was the older person. And then another detainee came. She was 76 years old. And she said to me, I just want to leave. I'm going to forgive, but I just need to leave here. She said, I don't want to leave after that because she's afraid of her brother's punishment who will kill her just because he would think that she has been raped. And this is something that's happening on the floor, on the ground. Women are uh, getting punished for someone else's crime, so to speak. I think the political solution will be the best thing to end all this suffering. This is important for the sustainability of peace in Syria. Thank you for sharing. I, I think those are important insights for, for us to know and for, um, for, for us and for our decision makers. If, and we looked to, to what a political situation involves. Um, Hanadi, did you want to add something quickly before we open up the, the floor for questions? Yes, regarding to what is possible for Canada to do. Recently, we have uh, seen that the United States have frozen its uh, support to establish uh, uh, peace and uh, settlement. And this has affected very badly a lot of groups and organizations, such as civil defense and White Hellman's. And as uh, my wonderful uh, friend has said earlier, about uh, the importance of work and the necessity of having those organizations on the ground as civil defense, they have to include women members in these groups. And the mechanism of the work is also important. It has to be coordinated with women. They have to be part of those uh, uh, liberated areas and be there. Uh, uh, to coordinate with the uh, uh, opposition in policing. Uh, in policing, for instance, uh, women have worked in Idlib and Aleppo. It was a great experience. Uh, with the women's presence in those organizations and law enforcement have uh, set good grounds for the establishment of peace. And we are looking forward from Canada to give a very good uh, example in the empowerment of women and uh, support them. Uh, a lot of countries, unfortunately, like the United States, have stopped supporting uh, women. However, uh, in Al Zatari camp, for example, there are women who are uh, suffering a lot. There are women who are giving birth to uh, refugees in those camps. There are tens and hundreds of women who have been displaced from southern Damascus, Anguta, and uh, Homs. Uh, and now they are still in buses and in the open air living among insects and animals and they are covered by the by the sky a lot of women are still pregnant a lot of women are giving birth in the open they suffer they have very bad situations nobody's helping them in Al Bab region, for example, in Idlib, these are populated areas. 
and it is under the control of an extremist organization and uh, 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 northern Aleppo also has become very, populate, very populated because a lot of people from different parts of Syria are coming to that part of the city. So there need to be a lot of coordination with Syrians, especially the Turkish government, in order to give a possible and immediate solutions in order to uh, accommodate all those people and help them, uh, especially women who are under severe pressure. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do in Canada have a feminist international assistance policy. We do have a national action plan on women, peace and security. And you've certainly given us lots of concrete inroads on, on how to make those policy commitments real in the in the case of in the case of Syria. So I think that's that's very valuable inputs into um, into the work here in Canada. We have some time now. I'd like to open the floor. We're gonna take two or three questions from the audience and then I'll turn it back to the panel. Um, and then hopefully we'll have another round time for a, a second round of questions. Wula has a do you have the mic or the Louise has a mic? So here. Uh, my name is Rihanna Hashmi. Uh, uh, I, I'll, I'm really happy and congratulate all uh, six, including that, uh, for your wonderful work. It's not easy. It's. Uh, I will just talk about a few things. I come from Pakistan. I have worked in Pakistan and Afghanistan. So that is, uh, 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 take it as a granny or mother's advice, because we have been in this situation for last many years, uh, since Cold War with Russia, as uh, the same situation Syria is going through, uh, like uh, uh, two big powers are uh, Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia was also uh, were the main forces, and then Russia and America in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Coming back to the situation like women role in the peace and security, I just give you and uh, like where the role is of CEDA, uh, Canadian CEDA is uh, played very important role. Um, I just give example of when I was working in 87, um, I went in a region which was really community, each other were killing each other, like uh, Sunnis and Ismailis, and then um, <coughs> with the, this program organizing women's group, and after when Taliban came, this is the only region uh, when the women group came together, because you know, when you lose a son or daughter, uh, the mother's pain is same whether it's on one side or not other side. As you said, the detainees, how they are suffering. So for them, women role was very important. Even all of Pakistan, after Taliban, that was people were influenced, people were killing. But in that region, there still, up till now, there is no community fighting or community, because even Taliban wanted to influence, but they didn't listen to that. So that was role, that was the example where Canada played a role of catalyst. And this example, like uh, then there is a two, Abisma said very rightly, we have to work on both sides, at the policy level, at the grassroots level, and bring together. Without, and for um, for IDRC and uh, Canadian, uh, now GAC, at that time it was, uh, to work with the organization who has like a roots, a grassroots level, and with the community. If you are going to work at the project level, it will not work. Work. work with the community and have the mentoring approach, the small organization with the existing organization, because US, um, you said you are not happy, and it's good they have taken out. Right. Uh, we need to have. Uh, yeah. So for, for me, I think that Canada can play a role of catalyst, and your organization can play a role of like a, a negotiator with the both like a bridge between grassroots to the uh, uh, top level. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Rahana, we're going to take a couple of questions and then bring it back to see who on the panel would like to comment. Um, oh, uh, we have in the corner there. Thank you. My name is Margaret Huber. I head up Canada's International Council uh, <coughs> National Capital Branch. As a former ambassador to Syria's neighbors, to Jordan and Iraq, I'm delighted, uh, as we all are, to have the opportunity to hear such distinguished panelists today and thank IDRC and uh, the Global Center for Pluralism 
My question relates to a headline in today's news on Syria, which suggests that to have peace in Syria, we must accept uh, Bashar al-Assad and move forward. I'd like to hear the comments of some of the panelists on this. Thank you very much. We'll take one more right, right here. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Caitlin. Um, you spoke at length about the importance of women in government, not just in the peace negotiations um, and uh, political settlement. And so I was curious on how we can, and how you and Canada can support you in laying the groundwork now to protect women against gender-based electoral violence. Okay, we don't have time to have everyone respond to every question, but maybe I'll ask two or three panelists if there's someone who wants to talk about the future, the, the headlines on, on do we have to accept Assad in terms of if Syria goes ahead and holds elections, will there be protections for women in electoral violence? We've seen that in a number of areas. And the, the links between, or the role for Canada as a catalyst linking the the grassroots and, and other areas. Hin, do you, yeah, you okay. would like uh, to make a comment? Uh, yeah, a very quick comment to my sister, Rohana. Thank you for your uh, comment. Very valuable because this is exactly what is this amazing team doing because they, have, they don't have only one hat. They always work in politics and in other hat like in civil society and they're very linked to the ground. We were in March in uh, Jordan in the refugee camps and we did kind of election workshop so we can start it's not only about us learning we need to teach and we need to prepare the grassroots and this is will give us many credibility too that we are not here in the ivory tower because we go to the ground and work so it is very valuable and we can see when we did the workshop with the women how they are responded and they were very ambitious to take leadership position in the futures where there is so many other men groups, they were more bitter. So we can see that for the future, this is exactly, and we made sure last year when we are doing the Geneva talks, before we go, we go to Jordan or Lebanon to Bika and get what they really want the women. So we got uh, papers, uh, we stick it on the uh, uh, wall in our uh, meetings room in Geneva to, s to let the man see what the woman wants. So this is exactly, and I remember Robin came one day, she looked at it and she said, this is exactly what do they need this man to, s to hear what the woman on the ground. Listen, mm -hmm. I got my one minute. <laughs> Good. Basma, please. In, in one minute, I think uh, we have asked uh, a number of, uh, made a number of suggestions on, about, on what Canada can do. I would say what Canada should not do, please. And we beg the government of Canada not to do a number of things. That is, typically these kinds of statements are, have been over the years the most damaging for a political <coughs> solution because uh, these are taken by the uh, Assad regime as a uh, recognition, a re-legitimization, which uh, is a carrot that is given for free. Has he cooperated in negotiations? Has he made any concession? The answer is no. And any carrot he is given is turned into a stick against the people. That is exactly what has been happening for the last seven years. We suffer from that, and I think any policy that seeks to uphold justice or to uh, establish uh, accountability mechanisms is totally undermined if we have these kinds of statements or participation in any uh, as you may know, there is the disarmament forum <coughs> where the Syrian regime, or Syria, is the country that will chair. Can we imagine for a second that a representative of Assad will chair this commission uh, and countries will be sitting there? So we are saying, please, there are things 
that you should not do uh, in order to keep the credibility of what you're trying to do. And we are going for a political solution. As an opposition, you will see that there are no statements that Assad should go as a precondition. It is stated in the texts, including by those armed groups that joined the negotiation process, Assad should go in an early phase of the transition. That tells you the space we have left for negotiation, for consolidating an agreement, but the transition we have never seen, never seen any sign that there is a will to cooperate on anything. Unfortunately, go back to 2011, the moderates within the regime were all sidelined. The warmongers were the ones who remained around Assad, and their logic has prevailed for the last seven years. And that is how the people of Syria have paid the price they have paid. So it is uh, vital for us not to see these kinds of participation, statements, and gestures that Assad uses in all his media to say, oh, Canada is with us. Canada wants me. Mm -hmm. I think you, you got a good response to you, a good an answer to your, uh, Thank to you. your question. Would, one quick, Perfect. Alice, did you want to add something? And then we'll try to squeeze in one more round of uh, questions. Uh, Just in answer to this question, it is very important when we talk about accountability and uh, the fact that Bashar al-Assad has to stay in the provisional or interim phase, uh, I think it has to be done because of the uh, Americans and Russians monopolizing the decision. When we talk about peace, we have to remember that the regime is at the top. Uh, and in charge of what happened. So you're talking about accountability for war criminals. He's the criminal number one who has been in charge of all the war crimes in Syria. You want to talk about releasing the detainees, the only detainees that have been released at the end of 2011, in the beginning of the Syrian revolution, are 6,000 Islamists. Most of them formed the Islamic factions and the extremist Islamist factions that burned the rightful demands of the Syrian revolution. He's the one that wanted us to reach this deadline so that the international community would have two options. ISIS served the uh, Syrian regime of Assad uh, because it enabled him to say, uh, let's try to preserve what we have under Assad in order to reach a political solution for everybody to reach the interest of everybody except for Syrians. We want political settlement, but we want it to be fair and just. You want to talk about interim period. We need to rebuild the army by excluding all the criminals. We need a safe, uh, neutral environment, uh, the general freedoms, release of the detainees, freedom of the press, in order to pave the way for a true transition. How are you going to do that with the criminal number one in the process? We have time for another quick round. If you keep your comments too um, short, I think we can squeeze it in. Rachel, oh, so who did you see there? <coughs> okay, we'll go with Louise's, who Louise saw. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for coming and for your work and for your courage. And thanks, Beth, for moderating. And uh, my name is Rebecca Sears. I work with uh, Mennonite Central Committee. Um, I guess my question is, I'm hearing, so we're, we have these the peace talks in Geneva and also the there's other peace negotiations going on in Sochi, the, the two, and you, you have it, these two different processes, like, there are significant gaps. So in Geneva, there's a lack of representatives from regime. In Sochi, it's the opposite. There's no representatives from any opposition. And I guess, like, in terms of how do we, uh, do you, if you have any tips or any steps, uh, how do how do we get these kinds of people together, like on the high level, but also at the grassroots? So thinking about any grassroots women's organizations that may be working <coughs> inside. Of, of regime held territory like like in that are working also and so how do like, I guess if you had any suggestions for how to get these kinds of groups together because if unless everyone's at the table like is what I've heard from you folks then you're not going to have um, a successful negotiation great thanks Becca um, 
Who did you say, Louise? Rachel? I think my question is a little bit of a follow-up to Becca's. Uh, first of all, my name is Rachel Vincent. I'm from a women's uh, feminist peace organization called Nobel Women's Initiative. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your presence, and thank you to IDRC and Global Affairs Canada for organizing this. This is an incredibly important conversation, and your analysis is highly appreciated. Just to, in follow-up to what Becca was asking, could you paint maybe a picture of what the ideal scenario for it would be at this point for you? It helps us in terms of advocating for what, how we can support a political solution that you see as a viable one, if you could quickly paint that picture for us. Thank you. Great. Let's take one more, and then we'll turn it back to the panel. Who did you saw over there? Thank you. Ahmed from Tunisia. Uh, I would like to make some comments, but I wouldn't address the political aspect because of its complexity. But I think that what was mentioned by all of you is the role of the civil society and particularly women's associations. And here I would like to shift to Arabic. Uh, I believe there is a big uh, possibility to communicate with women organizations in Tunisia because we believe that the role of the civil society in Tunisia was crucial and uh, enabled us to write a constitution that guarantees women's rights and women's political role. And it also guaranteed the entry of women uh, through that wide door uh, into uh, playing its full role in the society. I believe that the political uh, nature would come from the foundation, would come from the grassroots, from women organizations that play a very important role, especially in our Arabic Islamic societies where basically women have no role. Thank you very much. Thank you so suggest. much for your question. I think given the time, Hello. what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask everyone to take a couple of minutes to respond to those questions or, or the one on elections, on the importance of the grassroots. What's your ideal scenario to follow up on Rachel's question? Or even something else that occurred to you and if there's anything that gives you hope in this current situation. Um, and here, each of you to help us wrap up, because unfortunately we're, we're running, running towards the end of our, our time limit, even though I think we could go on for another couple of hours. It's been it's absolutely fascinating. Um, but let's start down at the, at the far end. Elise, do you have a response to these questions or concluding comments that you would like to leave us with? I believe that a fair and ideal justice, that's Rachel's question, uh, uh, the international uh, resolution starting by Geneva 1 statement, uh, and that is the agenda of negotiations uh, 2254. The ideal solution is a political transition that starts with a provisional interim government that paves the way for transition uh, that would have all kinds of competencies, legislative, uh, political, um, and we have put a full road map that would guarantee the uh, freedoms of everybody. However, the interests of uh, other countries uh, have let have become a conflict of agendas, and this is what's stopping the execution of such international resolutions. After the uh, U.S.-Russia agreement uh, uh, about the start of the political process from the electoral and constitutional process. Uh, with restricting the negotiations to these files. We always say you cannot reach any constitution unless you have a neutral and safe environment. Uh, 
that would enable all Syrians uh, to participate, including the displaced ones outside Syria, the refugees, the detainees, freedom of the press, freedom of the media, the laws of the parties. You have to uh, re uh, uh, make sure that all these are available in order to have a true electoral process that could reach the state of the uh, rule of the law. But now with the regime, uh, I believe we are going to reach a distorted political solution. This is what we need to uh, execute the international resolutions. We, the Syrians, have not taken part in such resolutions, but at least within the space that we have, we require these uh, uh, resolutions to be put into effect. Thank you very much. Fadwad, was there a response to some of the comments or questions or some closing remarks that you'd like to make? Yes, I would like to uh, reinforce what my colleague Alice uh, has just said. Uh, the Assad regime uh, is trying its best to distort the resolution uh, uh, 1354 and not to go to Geneva. Uh, so it is uh, uh, talking about the other conferences like uh, Suchi, like Astana. It's all to distort uh, 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 the facts because it does not want to go to Geneva. It does not want to sit around the negotiation table. What we need from Canada is to stand behind us to pressurize uh, Assad and its regime to go back to the negotiation table and to go back to Resolution 2254. I support this proposition about working with women in uh, Tunisia, and really we aspire to reach this true Arab Spring. Thank you very much for your presence with us and for hearing us. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to us and to hear us. Thank you. I want to say uh, what uh, uh, my hope is built on the difficulties we have experienced over the last seven years in some specific areas. Uh, one of them is that uh, we have been prevented, actively prevented, uh, from our side, but particularly from the other side, uh, by Assad to connect with the communities uh, which he, we, we really know from the inside that they have been hijacked to support him, that they have been kept in a uh, in fear so that and the fear has been cultivated for them to continue to continue supporting him we are uh, logistically uh, unable to reach and connect with the other part of Syria and these Syrians are our future together if we do not reach out to them we cannot build this future for a united Syria. I would like to see foreign troops, forces, militias, groups out of Syria as the first steps of a peace process. I would like to see our ability to connect with the Syrian society in all its dimensions, all its components. And uh, I would say I would like also to see that women go and vote massively, massively, if we are given the opportunity to have free and fair elections. It's a very complex operation, but uh, the work we can do as women is hopefully benefit from technical support, but mobilize the women to understand that they are the ones who will decide the future of Syria. Mathematically, it's them who can decide the future of Syria. I don't think they realize for the moment. And that kind of awareness is what we need to work on most urgently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hanadi. Uh, 
هناك الكثير طبعا من الامنيات والاهداف التي نتمنى بالفعل many wishes there are that we need to establish for the future of Syria. I thank the lady that talked about a very vital issue concerning what Canada can do in order to support humanitarian organization and uh, sexual violence that is committed in Syria. We have two main issues. Number one, uh, we have a very severe uh, reality and we need to deal with it. Uh, the society is paying the price and this the price of this uh, uh, active hostilities women and children are the first components that are paying for this uh, violence how to do with this current situation we can do it through uh, two ways number one empowerment of all on all levels and training that is support that is, that should be given to all walks of life including the warring factions the armed forces uh, civil communities uh, local groups uh, and uh, family activities this is number one so training and empowerment they must be put in place and also teaching about the international humanitarian law and the protection of women's right, women, uh, children's rights, protect them from sexual violence during conflicts. This is vital. The second issue, we need to focus mainly on enlarging the circle in order to include other more issues uh, like the uh, like driving ch children to fight this is important uh, we're not we don't only want to talk here about women we also need to talk about children those children are Syrians they are the future of Syria so there should be a uh, real uh, importance that must be placed on the issue of children and children conscription in uh, war there are massive numbers and those numbers are scary there are statistics a lot of organizations have done a great deal about uh, ch children who fight in uh, groups such as organizations in like the PKK for instance the other aspect and the other component that we need to work for the future of Syria is the inclusion of all those aspects in the future resolutions and in the Syrian constitution. There should be specific laws for the protection of child, protection of woman, and also to address all those issues such as sexual violence, uh, atrocities committed against the communities. I and my colleagues, we hope to live a situation uh, where we see a unified and liberated Syria, Syria the state of law. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know we've reached noon, but I'm asking your permission just to go a little over so we can. Yes, yes, yes. So, so we'll go. We'll make sure that we hear from everyone, and uh, and and then we'll call, we'll wrap everything yeah. up. So over to you, Hint. Yes, uh, I'm. It's hard to be almost the end because uh, all the good ideas has been said, but <laughs> but I want to add about what uh, my our colleague Ahmed said. We do realize that. Uh, Tunisia was a good example because of this vibrant civil society you have. And we learned from your experience. That's why for the last seven years, we've been working so hard in supporting the civil society. And it's our focus. And, uh, and I know we have a very good uh, narratives and successful stories based on a vibrant, successful uh, civil societies. So thank you for your, uh, and we do work with some of the great women, Tunisian women, and they are a role model. Anyway, uh, regarding the hope, um, I remember uh, last year we've been very frustrated, and uh, Alice and I, we decided to go to South Turkey to work with the women in Rihani. 
and it's been very hard on us to work with them, teach them politics, and uh, but we were very tired. But we ended up, we had, it, it was the Aleppo problems, and before Daraya, Aleppo, it been very hard. Those women give us hope, because we know that despite all these difficulties they have, they wake up in the morning and they know that they want to see Syria, the best scenario you just ask for. They want to see Syria, pluralism, Syria, where all the citizens are equal. So, uh, and including the civil societies with the SNC before the HNC, when I was the head of the legal uh, committee, we insist, Ahmad, to have the civil society voice in the vision to get their feedback and what do they want. This wasn't like this before, and I don't think in any Arab country they used to think about politicians, civil society, who are they? Are they traitors, spies? What do they do? This is always the, uh, the conspiracy theory about who are those civil societies. Now, they are our partners. And we do things, they are our conscience. And if they criticize us, we know that they are right and we need to be up to their standard. Thank you very much. And the final word goes to Ruba. Okay. Uh, I will speak in short. I'm not going to be long. We always say that uh, hope comes from pain. I lost my only brother. He was uh, an officer in the army. He refused to kill the civilians. The regime killed him. I am proud of my brother because he stood to the right. It's a huge loss for me, I agree, but this is an issue of a country. Free Syria, democratic Syria, without the Assad regime. My lady, you ask about Assad. Would you agree to lose a child or a, or a brother because of a person? Would you agree that this person remained in power? I don't think anybody would let a criminal regime that killed their loved ones remain in power. I have a child. My brother has a boy and a girl. And those boy and girl are the future of Syria. There are hundreds of thousands of people who lost parents and loved ones and they're without families now. They are the hope of Syria. They are the future of Syria. We want of Canada and the people of Canada to protect those people and take care of them and educate them. We want to go back to Syria. Nobody wants to immigrate here or to seek refugee protection in those other countries. We want to live in our country free and democratic. We want to take our revenge upon this regime that killed us and displaced us. I feel that Syria, the free Syria, uh, in the eyes of uh, my nephew and my niece, those children will build this country and will made it move forward. We are happy to build Syria without that criminal regime. So, uh, thank you very much to all of our panelists. We appreciated your your insights on the current challenges sharing with us some of the complexities i'm sure we could have had this discussion going on longer but you've given us little windows into a multitude of of, of issues we um appreciate your commitment to to peace to justice um we thank you for your 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 thoughts and for sharing with us and we thank you for your suggestions for what Canada can do. Um, you, you've given us very much um, proof that all issues are women's issues, that women have important things to say about all aspects of, of peace and security, from the military to, to justice, to elections, to constitutions, to negotiations. And you've demonstrated very, very clearly that these discussions are much richer uh, much fuller when women are involved with them. So please join me in thanking our panel.